How do you do? No alcoholic is really anonymous, someone has quipped. Certainly not the man in this story. The bottles that he embraced led to rowdy behavior and rewarded him with blackouts. Every time he hit bottom, he dug deeper. Until one day he looked in the mirror and saw what he was. Someone else looked in that mirror too, revealing what he could be. And his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Did you call our hotline? Yeah, I'm, I'm Bill. Come in. Sit down. Let me move these bottles. Um, my name is Lenny, and I have hope for you, Bill. I've been sober for decades now. Do you, do you live in this motel? No, the uh, police ordered me to stay away from home for three days. Oh, why? I, did... I punched my wife in the face. I, I'd never hit her before, and the worst part is uh, our four-year-old daughter saw what I did. It was a new low. I'm sorry to hear that, Bill. Booze can steadily take you downward. Yeah, some people have control. Alcohol is poison. You poison your brain, it can make you do some stupid things. Yeah, I've been arrested so many times. Wrecked my cars, gone to jail. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. The policeman was kind. Didn't even handcuff me this time. Told me to get help before I lost my job and family. But I, I can't change, Lenny. I've tried. I have no control over my life, and this cycle goes on and on. I felt so hopeless in that jail. I've been there. No, but this time was different. I, I was suddenly released. Didn't have to pay bail or even see a judge. Oh, that is unusual. I couldn't go home, so I called in sick to work. And bought a three-day supply of liquor. Didn't sleep, didn't eat, just drank. I mean, look at me. I don't want to sober up because I'll have to face what I did to my family, but I'm so tired of this life. Bill, you can change. I, I really want to, but I don't know how. I've tried rehab, antidepressants, everything. Do you believe in God? Yes, but I'm not sure why. I've prayed for 22 years for God to remove my alcoholism, and he doesn't answer my prayer. I lay on the floor in a drunken stupor and begged God not to let me die that way. What kind of God doesn't answer a prayer like that? Something wrong with him or something wrong with me? Bill, the reason your prayers don't work and your life is a mess is because you want God to fix things your way. You have to learn to do things his way. Introducing a friend that sticks closer than a brother... This is Unshackled, true life stories of real people, dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Most people are too busy to notice the homeless, scrounging for food or dozing in doorways after a sleepless night in the open. Pacific Garden Mission has noticed them since 1877. The old lighthouse offers nourishing meals, fresh clothing, and a safe place to sleep. The hundreds of hapless men, women, and children without homes and without hope. Mission pastors and counselors share the good news with everyone who enters, inviting them to come and see for themselves the one who provides necessities and offers the way to a better life. And who doesn't want that? That way and that person are what this program celebrates, going out to a darkening world in need of light. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3,541 in the series, Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. I didn't know how to do things God's way, but I agreed to try. Lenny gave me his phone number and offered to mentor me. The next morning I called Lenny and he invited me to his house where he fixed me a breakfast I couldn't eat. When he learned how much alcohol I'd consumed in that motel room, he drove me to the emergency room. You drank a three-day supply of booze in a day and a half? Bill, you need to go into detox. They'll dry you out and teach you strategies to stay sober. Oh, no, I, can't, I can't do that. I'll miss even more work and jeopardize my job. What kind of work do you do? I'm an airline mechanic. 
Guys I work with drink, but not like me. If the airline finds out I'm a hardcore drunk that needs treatment, I'll get fired. You agreed to start living God's way, remember? Didn't know it'd be so hard. I never said it'd be easy. Would the man in our story learn to do things a new way? We'll hear the sobering answer in this, the true testimony of Bill Schlipp, right now on Unshackled. Alcohol was always at the center of family gatherings. My grandfather let us kids take sips of his beer, so I developed a taste for alcohol at an early age. When the adults left their card tables to go upstairs to eat, I'd finish off the drinks they left behind. By the age of eight, I had my first blackout. At eight years old? What'd your family do? Uh, well, nobody seemed to notice, Lanny. Woke up in my bedroom with no memory of how I got there. How'd the drinking affect you, Bill? May have been the reason my mother made me repeat the second grade. My grades were poor, but I tried so hard to pass and did. I was bitterly disappointed when Mom held me back anyway. I, I attended parochial school and had to face all my classmates who passed. What about your father? My parents divorced when I was two. We lived with my grandparents until Mom remarried. And did you like your stepfather? He treated me like his own son. Took good care of us, but he drank heavily. Ooh, bad example to you. We moved to a place on Lake Tishigan where I could go boating and fishing in the summer, skate on the ice in the winter. Loved that place. But I was shocked at the wild behavior of kids in public school. Yeah, different from parochial school, huh? <laughs> Insubordinate. Rebellious. First I was horrified. Then I, I liked the new freedom. Of course. I started lying to my parents, hiding my smoking and drinking. By the time we moved away two years later, my behavior was depraved. My stepfather drank more, too, and Mom demanded we move or she'd divorce him. By then you must have been a teenager, hmm? My stepfather was so successful as a CPA that we moved to a big house in an upper-class part of New Berlin. I struggled to make friends, and my parents didn't understand. I wish we hadn't moved here, Mom. This is a beautiful house. I mean the town. I like the school at Lake Tishigan better. Why? I don't have any friends here. Oh, Billy, you'll make friends. Give it time. Y you don't understand, Mom. Nobody likes me. Go out for sports, baseball or something. I'm no good at sports. Schools have other activities, Billy. You're just not trying hard enough. I became withdrawn and depressed. The same feelings I had when Mom held me back in second grade. The school combined middle and high school, and a guy in our neighborhood befriended me. His two friends also accepted me, and I soon dressed like them and smoked and drank like them. <laughs> Bet your dad didn't even notice the liquor we drank last time, huh, Billy? Yeah, he's too busy with his new company. Uh, different job? Yeah. He and Mom started their own company, and all they do is work now. Uh, leaving us to guard the liquor supply, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. right? Hey, we could have a party here, and they wouldn't even know. Huh? Girls and everything. Yeah. yeah. Huh? <laughs> all right, this coming Friday, okay? Right after class. I'll bring the drugs. <laughs> Alcohol reduced my anxiety. I could fit in with almost anybody after drinking a beer or two. My drug and alcohol usage grew in high school, along with increasingly risky behavior. I didn't notice that friends were more controlled, more responsible than I. Instead, I became pushy and angry if they chose to do homework or be home at a certain time. To loosen up, I began drinking before parties. I quickly exceeded my limits and had blackouts. You don't remember coming on to Adele? No. Dude, you were so disgusting. Her boyfriend almost wiped the floor with you. If we hadn't gotten you out of there, he would have killed you. I don't remember anything. And then you picked a fight with Kevin, who came to your defense. Oh, man. I'm sorry. Hey, listen, back off the booze, Billy. Nobody wants you at parties anymore. Over time, my friends decided I was too great a liability and rejected me. I was increasingly aware of, but didn't own, my shameful behavior. I quit using drugs, hoping to gain control of myself, but I needed alcohol to socialize. I managed to stay out of legal trouble, worked during high school, and graduated. Then I enrolled at an engineering college, but my drunkenness led to frequent arrests, so I quit college and moved out of my parents' house. Despite my drunk and disorderly conduct, 
I survived a year before I drank up my rent money and shamefully asked to move home again. Uh, we're very reluctant, Billy. You've been in so much trouble. I know, Mom, but I'm, I'm trying to change. What about your education? Well, I'm thinking about a technical college in Milwaukee. I could learn to be an airplane mechanic. Well, if you limit your drinking, stay out of trouble and go back to school, we'll see how it goes. But if you don't keep your end of the bargain, you'll have to move on with your life somewhere else. Apparently you succeeded. Well, I drank a lot, but I'm mechanically gifted. I managed to pass the FAA exams and become a licensed mechanic at the age of 23. Where you work? Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Mm. Love my job. Been there more than a dozen years. And what about your drinking? Well, I work a lot of overtime, and I always quit drinking at least eight hours before I go to work. Yeah. Well, here we are at the hospital. I'm going to wait for you. I'll take you to detox. <sighs> going way out of your way for me, Lenny. I do the same for all the guys I mentor, Bill. Helping others is what life's all about. I just don't want to lose my job. Going to detox for three days. Um, look... I'll call your boss and tell him you're sick in the hospital and need to be off work a couple more days, okay? Hey, Billy, I called your boss. What'd he say? I sent his regards for a quick recovery, and you have a week of vacation time you can use to cover the time off. Wow, what a relief. I, I thought I'd used all my sick and vacation time. Now see, when you do things right, it works out. Yeah, maybe it pays to live God's way. So... What'd the doctor say? Well, then my blood alcohol level and blood pressure were so high, it's a miracle I'm still alive. Mm, detox, here we come. Uh, what about my car? Um, I'll pick you up when you're released. Make sure you don't head for a bar. I was released from detox three days later, terrified that I'd have to stay sober on my own. Lenny told me I should immediately go to an alcoholic support group meeting, and I assumed he would go with me. But he was meeting with another alcoholic, so I had to go alone. Fear crept in. I considered two options. I could sneak a quick drink for courage, or I could skip the meeting and lie to Lenny. When I pulled up to the meeting place, I saw 30 people standing outside socializing. How could I find the courage to mingle without a drink? We'll hear what happened to Bill in just a moment. Here's the president of Pacific Garden Mission, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. Small wonder so many people drift aimlessly through life. They know nothing about God and His purpose for their lives. That's why we have the New Life Bible Program at Pacific Garden Mission, teaching those who want more than the world offers but don't know how to begin. We begin by laying a sure foundation on the cornerstone, a relationship with Christ. Knowing Jesus personally is essential to following God's plan for any life. In each phase of the New Life program, our students gain life skills that enable them to reach others with the good news. They learn to speak and write with clarity while learning to apply God's Word in any life situation, theirs and others, that God brings into their lives. Precept upon precept, our students build on the sure foundation until they graduate and go out to serve the Lord. To learn more about this ministry or any of our other ministries, visit our website, pgm.org, or write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. I was tempted to skip the alcoholic support group, sneak off and get a drink and lie to Lenny. But deceiving others was my old way, and I was trying to live God's way. So I manned up and I, I went to the meeting. Good thing, because Lenny held me accountable when we met later, and I told him how I had been tempted to lie. Honesty really is the best policy, Bill. Lies catch up to you. Takes a lot of faith to do God's will. Yes, it does. But it's important to follow God as you understand him. Well, my understanding of God is completely different now. How so? I grew up seeing him as all-powerful, waiting to punish me for wrongdoing. But in that motel room, after I drank all that liquor, I, I stumbled into the bathroom and I saw myself in a mirror. 
I looked like a corpse, Lenny. Filthy hair, dirty face, red eyes. You saw me, a hopeless drunk, dead in my sins and powerless to save myself. I had to close my eyes, and when I did, it felt like God was smiling at me. Smiling? As if he loved me and was saying, I know you can't stop drinking. I've been trying to show my love to you since the day you were born. I didn't ever want to drink again. That's when I called the hotline. Bill, did you tell the people at the meeting about your experience in the motel room? No. That's all I could do to join them inside. Uh, you should do that next time. Helping others is part of the recovery. God gave me the strength to go to that recovery meeting without a drink. And God will give you the courage to speak up next time. I agree. As I left the group later, I saw that obedience opens the door to God's power. He gives us the desire and the ability to do his will. You're doing great, Bill. But when you talk about God, avoid the word sin. It's a loaded word. So is the name Jesus. Just talk about God. But I believe in Jesus. You can believe in whatever God works for you as long as you don't try to force it on someone else. Okay. But here's the best part, Lenny. I was sitting at home, reading, when I decided to thank God for his loving kindness toward me. As I prayed, I realized that I haven't had the desire to drink since I got out of detox three days ago. The craving is gone? Completely. That's the biggest miracle of all. God answered my prayer of 22 years. My desire for alcohol never returned, and I can't overstate how miraculous that was. For 22 years, I couldn't go a day without giving in to the desire for drink. And suddenly, I was no longer in bondage. I felt so indebted to Lenny, who told me to do things God's way, that I devoted the next eight years of my life to the alcoholic support group that helped me so much. I stood up at meetings and described how I was a new man. Yeah, <sighs> alcohol is too expensive. <laughs> it cost me two marriages. Both my former wives drank like me, and, oh, it was a disaster. The last time I drank, eight years ago, in that motel room, I drank so much I was stumbling and shaking. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about, huh? My reflection in the mirror was so disgusting, I closed my eyes. And, and when I did, I knew God was with me. He is a loving God, not waiting around to punish you. He wants what is good for us. I am so glad I called our hotline. Lenny told me to do things God's way, and, and that's what you should do, too. If you turn your lives and your will over to God, as I did, you can be sober like me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hey, good job, Bill. Huh? Oh, thanks, thanks. Hey, Lenny, Lenny, I've, uh, I've been thinking about going to church again. Don't do it, Bill. Huh? Why not? If you get involved with church, you won't have time for our meetings, and then you'll start drinking again. Oh, God forbid. Keep mentoring your guys. Working with another alcoholic is the best way to stay sober. You're serving your God that way. Well, maybe you're right. About that time, someone gave me a life recovery Bible. It spoke of God, not God as you understand him. Commentary at the bottom of each page explained how scripture on that page could help overcome any problem. As I read the epistles, I understood that my biggest problem was not alcoholism, but sin. And the entire Bible, even the Old Testament, was about Jesus. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Oh, God, I have been so blind. I've been telling people to come to you through recovery meetings instead of through Christ. I, I have to make a choice. Do I follow the 12 steps or do I follow Jesus? What's up, Bill? Lenny, I'm, uh, I'm going to start going to church again. Don't say I didn't warn you. The church didn't save you. No, God did. I'm grateful to you for telling me to do things his way. Get away from the group and you'll start craving drink again. No, I don't think so. God removed the craving before I ever attended a meeting. I need to tell others about Jesus, but 
we're not supposed to mention salvation at meetings. That's because sobriety is the goal, not salvation. Jesus is a stumbling block to some people's sobriety. Lenny, I believe Jesus is the door to salvation, the anchor of the soul. Over time, Lenny became increasingly cold toward me, as did most of my closest friends in the alcoholic support group. Even the men I sponsored seemed to no longer trust me and quit talking to me. They were holding on to their own gods. I felt sad and disappointed, but my faith became stronger as I began attending a local church. I loved the worship and hearing God's word openly preached. That's where I met Judy. Have you found a mentor yet, Bill? No, I've, I've asked a couple of men, but they both declined. Hmm, I'm surprised. So am I. I. I'm eager to share Christ, and I thought others would be too. Did they give reasons? Well, one didn't have time, the other didn't feel qualified. The Holy Spirit will guide you. He does. But I want someone to show me how to live out the Christian life. One-on-one -on -one relationships keep a person accountable. If discipleship is vital to sobriety, how much more important is it to share eternal life? Exactly. It's disappointing that men in recovery groups are more dedicated to what they believe than men in the church. The Great Commission to go and make disciples? <laughs> has been forgotten by many. You know, the church has a recovery group. Yes. Uh, they've invited me to speak at the next meeting. I was soon asked to lead the recovery group at church, and I even spoke at other churches. The lifestyle of discipleship I had learned in recovery prepared me to help others, but I was still searching for a Christian mentor for myself. Judy and I married two years after we met at church. Another year passed. This came in the mail for you, Bill. Hmm? Oh, wonderful! Uh, I gave up on finding a mentor at church. Instead, I'm going to enroll in Bible college. That's a great idea. You know, I have enough seniority that I can adjust my hours at work to fit the class schedule. Interesting brochure. What degree will you pursue? A bachelor's degree in biblical studies. Good. I'll never have to tell someone who wants to be discipled that I'm not equipped to teach them. I continued as a mechanic at the airline while working on my degree. And I volunteered my time and testimony at various church-run Christian recovery programs. God is faithful. I had legal, financial, and relationship troubles when I began following God's way. But Jesus said, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible unto you. My faith zoomed as God dealt with my issues His way, in His time. You have to trust Him. I always thought I was powerless over alcohol. Turns out, we're all powerless over our problems, because the root problem is sin, separation from God. We want to satisfy our own lustful desires apart from God. That's why God sent Jesus to die for our sins, to give us a new beginning. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I'll be glad to introduce you. This was an exciting time for me, because occasionally a desperate man would seek me out after hearing my testimony, asking me to mentor him, and I did. I was able to complete my pastoral internship requirements at Pacific Garden Mission, and I received my degree in 2013. I retired early from my job two years later. A week after my retirement, I attended a taping of Unshackled. Thanks so much. All right. <laughs> uh, Did you enjoy the production, Bill? Pastor Phil! Yeah, oh, it was great. And you finished your degree? I did. Thanks to doing my pastoral internship here. We appreciate all the counseling help God sends us. Uh, I was grateful to work alongside your counselors, learning how they disciple others. Most of them have sacrificed their lives to disciple the homeless. Uh, you have an excellent program here to help the addicted. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Amen. When you retire, let us know. <laughs> I retired last week. He asked you to come on staff at the mission? Yes. What did you say? I said yes. 
The Lord has opened a door to ministry I love. Sometimes you muse that you wasted so many years, but God doesn't waste anything, Bill. That's true. 38 years apart from God and then eight years serving in alcoholic recovery groups has prepared me for this ministry. What will you be doing? Counseling men in the Bible program. I'll be discipling men who still struggle with their sinful nature. We all struggle with our sinful nature. True enough. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to comfort and guide us. A week later, I went on staff at Pacific Garden Mission. I have the opportunity to teach these men that it is their responsibility, as Christ followers, to pass on what they learn, becoming disciple makers themselves. Jesus said to his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Anyone called by his name, redeemed by his blood, should be mentoring the lost. Christ died to give us new life, so it is the least we can do. We hope you have been encouraged by this testimony of our God's ability to reach into any situation, no matter how hopeless, and redeem any life. All praise and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ listening friend if you have never invited Christ into your life why not do so now won't you pray with us dear Lord Jesus I believe you died on the cross for my sins I believe you rose again and live forevermore thank you for your sacrifice save me Lord come into my life and change me In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.